Hello, my name is Beck, and welcome to my top 10 favorite fantasy books. I know this is a really hard list for me to narrow down, but I've actually looked at all of the different series that I love as well, and I've picked a book out of each series that I love that I loved more than the series overall. So I made it a little bit easier on myself to narrow down my favorites, but I thought about also going from a list of 10 to 1 and making it like a ranking, but that's not going to work because all of these for me are a 10. So let's just get into this list because the first one is going to be one that a lot of people are very familiar with and it's The Name of the Wind by Patrick Rothfuss. This follows a boy named Quoth and he goes from a life of poverty to wanting to go to this magical university because of a few tragedies in his life and this is a wonderful fantasy book because of the way it's written and I really loved the lyrical kind of writing in here and the world building was just brilliant and I read this many years ago and it was one of my first forays into fantasy in general and I think I started at a very good place because I loved it so much. Really sad like everyone else that uh, the trilogy isn't finished yet but I also don't think the trilogy ever will be finished so if you want to pick it up probably do it as soon as you can because I don't think it's going to end up getting finished in my lifetime to be honest. And another thing that I like about The Name of the Wind is that it has two magic systems in it and I didn't realize this until I heard Brandon Sanderson talking about it who he's also one of my favorite authors so his books are going to show up in this video as well but which ones will they be? And Brandon described the magic systems in The Name of the Wind as a hard and a soft magic system and a hard magic system is when it has a lot of rules and so when they're at the magical university the rules there are very stock standard and they're understandable because obviously they're being taught at a school so the students can learn them and then practice them and that's what the magic system is. It's more close to alchemy rather than magic magic but there's also another magic that Kvothe witnessed when he was quite young and that was when he saw somebody literally call the name of the wind and it was like an elemental magic that swept through uh, his camp at the time. So Quoth is on like a personal quest to rediscover that magic but he doesn't really know how and because it doesn't have a system of rules there's also really no guidebook as to how to summon the wind either. So it's got a hard magic system at the university and also this other magic system that Quoth is interested in and a whole bunch of other stuff goes down obviously and this is told from Quoth as he's older and he's looking back at his younger self and telling his whole story to a chronicler so that's what the beginning of the book sets up in the first like 50 pages and then we jump straight into Quoth's story so if you're struggling with the beginning of the book just know that it goes into his past so it's worth sticking around for. It was a lot of fun. But now let me get into my second book. And like I said, it is Brandon Sanderson. It's The Words of Radiance. And this is the second book in his Stormlight Archive series. And I loved all of the books in this series. I gave them all five stars. But this has got to be my standout favorite because of the way the characters collide in here. And because this is like a peak action book, a lot of world building comes to a head in here. And so you see more of the magic system come into play. And obviously I'm being vague for a reason because I don't want to spoil the first book because I mean they're so long and you don't want spoilers regardless but if I got spoiled for such a long book I'd be very sad because it would be that much more effort that I'd have to put in into reading it but anyway The Way of Kings is a really hard one to describe but the way it starts is in two time jumps so 6,000 years ago you see the heralds and they're fighting off the desolation which is like an oncoming apocalypse in this world and then you skip forward and it's now only six years ago and the book opens with the assassination of King Gavilar and you see the ripple effects that causes mainly a war between the people of Rosha, which are like King Gavilar's people, and then the people in the Shattered Plains called the Parshendi. So a lot of world building has already just gone down and you see the magic used in the assassination of the king, which is really cool. And then after that time jump, we are now in the present and we are with Kaladin, Shalan and Dalinar, our three main characters. Kaladin is a surgeon who is also a soldier and he fights battle with the spear. Shalan is a scholar or she wants to become a scholar rather. And she also wants to become a scholar to Princess Yasna because Yasna potentially has something that is going to help Shalan out quite a lot, but she needs to steal it in order for it to work. So that is Kaladin and Shalan. They're more of the underdogs. And then Dalinar is actually King Gavilar's brother and King Gavilar was assassinated at the beginning of the book. And so you see him having to navigate politics when he didn't really do that before. He was more like a warlord and he also is having these dreams that he's not sure are prophetic or whether he's actually going mad. So you've got each character with their little turmoil and it's just wonderful to see the world explored through their perspectives and I love all of these characters. So naturally when a bunch of storylines started to collide in especially the second book, it's why it's my favorite because a lot of stuff starts to take off here. So I can't get into exactly why, 
but I think you'll forgive me because I don't want to spoil this book. <laughs> Just go read The Way of Kings. Okay, I'm going to smash out some more Sanderson books because the next one is The Hero of Ages by him. That is the third book in his Mistborn series. And I actually struggle to say that Mistborn is one of my favorite series by him, only because when I read it, I had a lot of expectations because people hyped it up so much. And while I do agree that the magic system is brilliant and the storytelling is wonderful, I actually didn't love the first book as much as everyone else did. I went from a four to four and a half and then Hero of Ages was a five star rating because it blew my mind. So if you're just enjoying the first book in the Mistborn series and you're like, ah, do I continue? You probably should because it only gets better with each installment. So Mistborn is talked about so frequently that I'm assuming people know what it's about. But if you don't, it follows a young street urchin named Vin and she actually knows the magic system but doesn't understand how to use it. and doesn't understand her potential either and she ends up getting picked up by this guy named Kelsia and he kind of saves her from a life of poverty I guess and she goes under his wing as like a mentor and he teaches her a bit of the magic system but also he tells her about this theory that he's got this rebellion that he wants to undertake about overthrowing the Lord Ruler because instead of the hero winning all of these years ago the Lord Ruler did and now everyone is stuck under his regime so they're trying to take him down so that's what the first book is encompassing but the way that the threads from the first book continued into the second and third and it was just oh I can't talk about it because it'll be spoilers. Hero of Ages was my favorite. I remember listening to the audiobook on my way home from work and I was just like clutching the steering wheel like for at least half the drive home because it just kept delivering punch after punch. So that's why the Hero of Ages is my favorite in that trilogy. But the Alloy of Law is actually another favorite that I'm going to segue right into because that is also a Mistborn book and it is the second era of Mistborn books. So Mistborn era one is the trilogy and then Mistborn era two starts with Alloy of Law and that is a quartet I believe but the last one isn't quite out yet. So it follows the same world that was in Mistborn but it's 300 years later. The second round is much more developed. For example, in the first book, we didn't have guns. In the second book, it started to develop in a similar way to our world developed and they've got cars and guns now. So that's really interesting when you consider that the magic system is reliant on metals for it to work because people who ingest these metals to burn them in their stomach and then control them, the world is becoming more metal. So they have more opportunity to wreak havoc. So it's interesting to see it developed later. And I love the characters that we are introduced to. But you follow Wax and you follow Wayne. I know Wax is our main character. He's kind of like a stand up law abiding citizen and he wants to be a detective. And he was when he was out in some backwater town. He was like the sheriff equivalent. Now he's come back because someone close to him has been killed and he's got to reconcile that I think and then potentially solve the murder a bunch of other stuff goes down as well but I don't remember and his sidekick Wayne is just like a loose unit and he's wonderful he's always changing out hats and doing disguises and stuff to get information and they work really well as a duo one really straight laced and one really funny so it's just a brilliant banter it's kind of like a cowboy almost set up and it's just great so that's why I loved Alloy of Law it had a very different flair to the Mistborn trilogy okay now I will move on past Sanson and go into the the Burning White by Brent Weeks. And this is also the fifth book in the Lightbringer series. The first book is The Black Prism. And this is a book that actually blew my mind quite a lot. And that's probably going to be pretty standard for most of the books on this list. I'm sorry it's the last book in the trilogy, but all of the world building and the characterization really just comes to a head in the last book. It's like natural. <laughs> so in this book, oh, I can't even say the things I loved because it'll be spoilers, but you get so much depth and characterization and so many revelations as well. And in the first book, The Black Prism, we're following Kip as one of the characters. It is multiple perspective. So we follow a few different moving parts and Kip is one of the main characters. There's also Gavin Guile, who is the prism. And in this world, the prism is like the peacekeeper, like the world balancer, essentially. The world works on a magic system of light and that light can be transmuted into color. And it depends on the capacity of people able to split light, because if you can split a couple of different kinds of light, then you're really capable. If you can't split any light, you're just like a mundane, basically. Not everyone can split light. Some people can. Some people can split more than one. The prism can split all. So he naturally has the role of maintaining the balance of the world because if he didn't maintain the balance, then the magic system would tear everything apart. So him plus politics plus Kip coming from an outside perspective into politics, into a magical school is how the magic system is explained to you because it's explained through Kip's understanding of it. And it's explained through Kip bringing his perspective of 
like a farm boy essentially to a political setting to give you context as to what the world is and to what people are like and then you flip into someone else's perspective and it explores Kip from an outside angle. So I like the way that Brent Weeks investigates his characters that way. He uses different lenses very very tactfully in order to reveal what kind of character these people are. Anyway, I can't describe it too much with keeping it vague and I don't want to accidentally go into spoilers, so just know that the last book in the series was absolutely incredible and it made my favourites list of 2019 and the way that things are built up, just as an example, I won't spoil anything obviously, one of the books at the beginning of the series states something and then that plays into the rest of the books just like as a side thing it's not really something that's like overarching and then in the last book it is revealed as like a one-liner as a joke and that's just incredible to me because that one line of joke took like three books build up but it was so worthwhile so if you want to know the amount of depth and imagination that goes into these books i think that is the best example i can leave you with i've had these up here the whole time okay i'm just i'm just and so the next book that I want to talk about is one that I mentioned quite a lot in my videos. It is Trade Displayed by Sebastian D. Castell. This is a adult fantasy. It's quite short. It's a quartet, so it's easy to blaze through. And when I read it, I initially read it on audiobook and the main character, Falcio, his voice on audiobook was just absolutely divine and it suited his character so well and this actually follows Falcio and his best friends Kest and Brasti and they're actually trying to find themselves and find meaning in their lives after an aftermath because their king was murdered and they were his basically his right hand men his lawmakers his great coats which enforce the law and justice on people and so because of that reason Falcio has a really heightened sense of idealism and so that sense of idealism tends to get him into a bit of a pickle because he will will willingly throw himself into danger to protect somebody that can't protect themselves. So it has a Three Musketeers kind of vibe when it comes to the banter in between Kest Brasti and Falcio and I love their humour and I love the situations that Falcio got into. It is a character driven work so I don't know how much I can really explain to you except to say that they're trying to find themselves after their king died and the system is now ruled by a bunch of dukes and obviously the dukes are corrupt because the king was trying to fight for justice. So it's a wonderful twisty series. It has magic in it, but it doesn't really come much into play until a bit later when you have more of a footing and a setting in the world. So it doesn't try and hit you with everything at once. It really develops the characters first. So it eases you into the world is what I'm trying to say. But within seven pages of listening to this or within seven pages of this book in general, I was laughing aloud. Falcio's voice is absolutely brilliant and I am very keen to reread these because I just want to laugh, I want a good time and I want characters that tug at my heartstrings because that's what all of these characters did. Next is a book that I haven't really talked about much on my channel because I read and finished this series before my channel really took off but I've got a bunch of her books behind me so Assassin's Fate by Robin Hobb is one of my all-time favorites as well and the first book in the Elderling series which is what this encompasses in like a broader sense is Assassin's Apprentice. The Assassin's Fate is the end of the Fits and Fool trilogy so it's a it's a long series and we follow the same characters intermittently not in every installment so I loved all of the characters in this and in the last book like I said the same thing with The Burning White. Obviously everything has been built up to that point for a purpose and that's why it was so cataclysmic because you already know all these characters, you already know all their struggles, you already understand the world building. So the story is the thing that's left to hook you. And the way that the story was executed was incredible to the point that I was up until like two in the morning reading that book because I mean, it's not a short book anyway, but I could not put it down because I needed to know how it ended. I think I read it in two sittings, which for a book of that size is pretty impressive. But to give you a little bit of a synopsis without giving you spoilers as to what the last book is about, I'm going to talk about Assassin's Apprentice. And that is the first book in the Farsia trilogy. I would encourage you to read further than Assassin's Apprentice if you're not sure on the series. Read the trilogy and then decide because I know for a fact that Robin Hobb does things at her own pace. She won't, you know, go off the handle and write in some action because she knows that's what her reader is craving. No, she writes her stories at her own pace and 
because she does that, you see a beautiful growth of character. You see it done very well like a flower blooming. And my favourite character, for example, doesn't come into this series until the second book. And I don't even think they come in at the beginning of the second book. So it is worthwhile sticking to, especially because I want people to meet my favourite character. We do follow an assassin named Fitz, but we follow him from when he's really young and he is trained to become an assassin kind of against his will kind of because it's really the only avenue left for him. Because he's a bastard son of the prince, he can't really leave because he's a liability to the royal line, but he also can't be trained in royal circles because he's a bastard son. So he's kind of in this gray area and he gets raised by the stable master. He gets kind of trained in politics and assassination. And then he also has magic that he kind of tries to keep quiet. One of them is the skill, which is a telepathic magic passed down through the royal line so that one is okay if people know about it but the other magic system that he has or that he kind of knows about is the wit and the wit is like a telepathic magic as well but it communicates with animals and so naturally people in this world view that as dirty because if you have a familiar and you bond with an animal you start to kind of take on traits that are like that animal so people saw that as others getting corrupted by the magic so that is why the wit is outlawed so if fits is found out to have the wit he will be killed so you've got a few moving parts even though this book is slow to start so i would encourage you to pick it up because i love this story fitz can get a little bit annoying in his decision making but him and the entire cast of characters around him are what make it amazing and i wouldn't have read to the end of the series if i didn't love it so the world building is incredible and uh, I'm just going to keep going on about Robin Hobbs. So I need to stop because she's a favorite author that I haven't read in a very long time. And like a book I mentioned earlier, I need to do a reread. <laughs> the next book is actually the only young adult book on this list, and it is Soulbinder by Sebastian de Castell. Yes, I talked about another series by him earlier on, Traitor's Blade, but this is his young adult series and it follows Kellen. And the first book is called Spellslinger. While I did enjoy all of the books in this series, Soulbinder hit me in a very different way because you follow Kellen's growth and Kellen Kellen's a young boy living in this town and he has to learn the magic system in order to advance in society. But unfortunately, he's not quite sparking the bands he needs to and these characters spark these bands to signify their magic user level effectively and there are different types of bands obviously and you need magic in order to spark the bands and even though he has all the knowledge of the way to use them and the hand signals that he needs in order to activate them he can't quite get there and so he has to rely very much on bluffing his way through situations to make people feel like he is the superior in their conversation because he's the weakling everyone kind of tries to pick on him and he also comes from a very toxic and manipulative background so he's not just fighting against the magic system and the people in his town he's fighting against those he loves as well and the first book is very much him trying to find himself and find connections to people that he deserves and you see him grow in a different way in each book and the way that soulbinder was done it was very much kellen trying to figure things out by himself whereas before he's kind of had friends around him as a support network to do so and I really felt for him in the fourth book I definitely cried more than once and so that's why I'm putting it on this list as well because if a book makes me cry then I automatically have respect for it because if it made me feel something then it's worth talking about you know so Kellen is just wonderful. There's a lot of humor littered in the series as well as the more darker moments and the more tense moments. So I would recommend it just because it's constantly filled with action and it does have more of a quest narrative after the first book. It's also very driven by character. And then I've only got two books left. So the second book on this list, it might seem like it's YA, but it's actually adult and it's called God's Grave by Jay Kristoff. This is the second book in his Nevernight trilogy and Nevernight follows a girl named Mia and when she was very young she saw her father put to death and now flash forward she is wanting to get revenge on the people that killed her father and trapped her family and so she is going to become an assassin and that is her goal in life so she ends up going to an assassin school but she doesn't get to the assassin school at the beginning uh, it takes a little bit of the first book for her to get there. So it's very much a build up to getting there. You understand her character and you understand more of the world because it's called Nevernight. There are three suns and the sun never really sets. And so people kind of always have shadows and our main character can actually transfer herself through shadows. So she can like 
shadow teleport effectively. She's also got a kind of shadow familiar called Mr. Kindly in the shape of a cat. So if you don't like the trope of talking animal, if you don't like the trope of assassin school or magical school, and if you don't like revenge plot, you probably won't like Nevernight. And I know it's also very stylized in the way it's told because it's like a book of a book, if that makes sense. It's a character telling you about Mia because in the first chapter, even in the first page or so, it tells you that she dies. So this is telling her story. So Nevernight was set up and assassin school and world building. And then in God's Grave, we're in a different place and it involves like an arena kind of thing. And I love an arena battle. I don't know what it is. It must just be a trope that I'm like, give it to me. And it was one of those books that I was constantly thinking about when I wasn't reading it. And then I was lapping it up when I was reading it. So if I went back to reread that series, I'd probably just pick up God's Grave because I know that I loved it the most. <laughs> and then last on this list is last, but definitely not least, because I said at the beginning of this video that all of these books are like, top tier for me. So the last one is A Little Hatred by Joe Abercrombie. And this one, again, takes a lot of build up to get to because even though it's his first book in the Age of Madness series, I don't know if it's a quartet or a trilogy, it's technically like the 10th or 11th book in the first law because he's had a whole bunch of books before it. And I actually started at The Blade itself, which is the first book, and I read all the way through up until A Little Hatred. And that came out in January this year. So it's a fairly new release. So you have time to catch up because the rest of the books in the Age of Madness have not come out. Yet. So I hesitate to tell you what it's actually about because of the things that will spoil because even just the synopsis will spoil what's happened in the past and you need all of that context in order to understand a little hatred because yes some characters are recurring they're just older um, yes some characters are talked about even though they're gone and so you need to know who these characters were and what their significance was in the past and what their pasts were like in order to understand the danger in the new book. And so I'm not going to give a synopsis of it, but I will say that I gave it five out of five stars and there were parts at the end that I was like holding the edge of my seat because it was so gripping. And the way that Joe Abercrombie writes is very gritty and dark. Obviously, it's a grim dark. And he also includes humor as well. So even if you're like up to your eyeballs in gross stuff, he'll throw in a joke and make you laugh and forget how gross it is. He's definitely the king of grim dark. I think he's very much earned that title. But if you want to read The Blade itself, it follows a few different characters. We start off with a character called Logan Ninefingers. He is very iconic across the series. And now he's ended up caught somewhere that he doesn't want to be. And the politics is something that is completely foreign to him. And he encounters a wizard named Baez. But if you encounter a wizard in regular fantasy, you're expecting that wizard to be ultimate good. And the way that Grimdark is, nobody is good and nobody is evil. Everybody is both. So the way it's explored is very dark and it's very eye-opening. And one of my favorite characters in that series is actually quite villainous because his name is Sandan Glockdar, but he was taken by the enemy in war a few years back and he was tortured to the point of beyond almost recognition. And now he's got such a twisted spine, he's missing teeth, he looks a bit grotesque, but he's really dark because he has become the chief torturer for his current king. So from becoming the tortured to the torturer is just something that is very dark. The way that Logan Ninefings is done, the way that Glockter is done, the way that a few of the other characters are done is just the best. And so I can't talk about a little hatred because it's going to spoil it. If you can read it, just read it in publication order because that's what I did. There is the trilogy. There's a bunch of standalones after the trilogy that follow individual storylines, but also have crossover characters throughout them. And then once you're done with those, go and read A Little Hatred because all of them build up. And make sure you read a short story called Sharp Ends because that gives you insight into the villain in the first trilogy. And I think that's actually the end of the video. So let me know what your favorites are down below. I would love to add favorites to my list. Thank you so much for watching this video and I will chat to you in the comments and I'll see you in my next one. Bye.